<laughs> Welcome. Um, we're going to talk today for the first time about parables. This is one of Aesop's fables that we just watched here. I love how they can make a fox look evil just by zooming in on his eyes. It's just got that menacing look. And I've never seen a stork smirk before, but I, you have now. Um, so we're going to talk new series that we're calling Parabole, which is the Greek word for parables. Uh, parables are stories that Jesus told uh, in the community around him. But before we get to that, I need to vent for just a moment because I don't know how your weeks looked, but my week looked like this. So this is what three and a half thousand gallons of water looks like on your basement floor. Um, sump pump failure, curse of a, of a home owner or renter or whatever. So I got to spend Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday helping the guys clear that up. Now the good news is this. Um, I built this basement, sort of put it in myself. Um, and I chose to build it like a foot from the wall because I thought it would help me get round and avoid all the drains. So the guy came in, and I didn't want to tell them that I'd built it myself. I thought that might affect, you know, what they'd be willing to pay for the insurance and stuff. I didn't know, so I just thought, I'm just not going to say anything unless they ask, and if they ask, I'll be honest. They never asked, but as they walked around, they said, this is incredible. Like, someone's built it so far from the, the, the foundation walls that we can get fans everywhere and dry it out. Whoever came up with this, this was an incredible idea. And everything within me wanted to say, it was my idea. I did it. It was me. And of course, I couldn't. So instead of having the satisfaction of telling the insurance adjuster, I'm telling you guys, and that's where I'm getting my... <laughs> sense of like self-respect from today. But the nice thing is the insurance are going to pay for everything. We didn't really lose any personal stuff or any sentimental stuff, so we survived well, and they're going to put in new carpet and all those things. So as much as it was a bad week uh, in that respect, you're like, hey, it turned around. That's a good thing uh, for us. So anyway, my little vent on what my week looked like. We're beginning this series looking at the parables of Jesus. What we'll probably do is split it into two parts. We'll do one part over the next few weeks before Advent, and then we'll probably go back to them sometime after Christmas because Jesus taught lots of parables. A couple of weeks ago, we looked at this idea that Jesus, in this obscure little passage in a book called Luke, were told he grew in wisdom and knowledge. The word grew there is this weird little word, procopto. It means to grow intentionally, kind of the same way that you might beat a path through some woodland. It's like Jesus choosing to become who he was going to become. It was an intentional thing. And then after 30 years of that, he wanders into the Galilean hillside, this small farming community, really, in the middle of Israel on a lakeside, and he begins telling stories. Simple stories that seem to be about every sort of day way of life. Now, if you want to get just stories out of them, you can. But I would suggest you might get something more. In actual fact, the fact that you chose to tell stories probably shouldn't come as a surprise to us at all. Stories have actually been around for as long as human beings have around, especially in an oral culture like this. Stories were the main focus. Stories were how people passed on information. If you go back to the earliest communities that we can find of human beings, stories were important. If you look at the aboriginal communities in Australia and New Zealand, stories function as ways of explaining everyday life. Incredibly, they they use stories as maps that they sing. So in some Aboriginal cultures, you'll find that the amount of time it takes to sing a certain story form of song is actually the amount of time it takes to complete the journey that you're going, and it will describe for you the rock that you're passing or the section of mountains that you're walking through. These stories have helped them function. We have stories that are like big meta-narratives that explain why the world is the way it is. The Christian story is our version of that for most of us. It explains the world that we see around us, explains evil in the world and why we see that through sin and those different aspects. That big meta-narrative is a story at its heart. And then you guys all have stories. We're approaching Thanksgiving, and many of you will go back to maybe your parents' house or to family gatherings, and the same stories, don't they just come out time and time again? You'll hear for the 30th time maybe the story about how your great uncle Bill many, many years ago did such and such a thing. Those stories repeat, repeat, repeat. And there's something about them that maybe it gives us comfort, maybe it gives us a joy, but stories are so important. Maybe it shouldn't surprise us that Jesus taught in story form. In actual fact, stories that have a point, have a purpose, 
have been around for a ton of time as well. We just watched one of the famous Aesop's fables. Here's a picture of a, an old book cover of Aesop. Here he is right here. Uh, he wrote multiple stories about animals, all of them designed to have some kind of point, some kind of message. The most famous one is the hare and the tortoise. What happens? The, the good old hare and tortoise, they get into an argument one day about who can run faster, and the, the tortoise is convinced he can outrun the hare. And of course, the hare knows this is nonsense, and they agree to race. And when they start, the hare bounds off to what he thinks is an insurmountable lead and decides to take a nap. So he lies down, falls asleep, and wakes up to see the tortoise just about to cross the finish line and realizes that he's been beaten. And the message that we're supposed to get is slow and steady wins the race. Just keep on going. It's not who starts fastest or moves quickest. It's about who keeps going. Aesop wrote these stories or collected these stories that were supposed to give little bits of a message. Stories that have a point have been around for a long time as well. When Jesus walks into the countryside and starts telling stories. He's fitting into a grand tradition that's Jewish particularly and has been around for thousands of years before him. Now, I think if you've been around in the church world for a while, and many of you have, there's a couple of mistakes that we can make about Jesus' parables, his stories. The first one is to, uh, to maybe take them too lightly, to think that they're just stories. And they're not, there's something more than that. If you want to find just stories, you can just find stories. But at the same time, Jesus is doing something very particular. He's giving you an opportunity, not to just get a point, but to learn a way of life. His stories aren't just points for one particular person, they are ways to live. But the other mistake you might make, and this is something that the church did for hundreds of years, is to take them too seriously. For some time, in history, and what I mean by serious is this, there was this desire to look at Jesus' stories and every single one of them had to have actually happened and to be factually detailed. And people wanted to give like allegorical associations for every character in them and say, well, this person is this person and this person is this person. And in actual fact, that was never how parables were designed to work. Many of you may have seen the famous movie, The Life of Brian, which is one of the most misunderstood movies of all time. It was banned in tons of countries because people thought it was blasphemous. In actual fact, it's not about Jesus at all. It's just pointing out weird aspects of culture back thousands of years ago. So poor Brian gets mistaken as the savior of the world. He knows he's not, his family know he's not, but everybody else around him thinks he is. So he has this awkward moment where he gets stuck in front of a crowd of people and he has to start teaching because that's what they expect. So he tries Jesus' fa famous line, consider the birds of the fields, and everyone says that he's, he's been mean to the birds. Why are you being so hard to the birds? Leave the birds alone, they're just being birds. He tries the lilies of the fields and then he jumps into parables and starts telling a story. One man's walking with a friend from Jerusalem to Jericho, and a guy in the crowd, played by the brilliant John Cleese, looks at him and says, okay, what was his name then? <laughs> and of course, Brian doesn't have a name because he wasn't a real person. But in fear of what the crowd will say, he makes up a name, and of course, then they notice the inconsistency and say, you said you didn't know what it is. You're making this up as you go along, aren't you? And of course, he is making it up as he goes along because Jesus was making it up as he went along as well. The brilliance of a parable storyteller was the ability to create a story out of nothing and attach it to something brilliant. That was what made you good at it. It wasn't having experienced or heard a real story and using it, it was making it up. That was the art form and Jesus is doing something that Jewish people had done for hundreds and thousands of years before him. There's a Jewish tradition that's called mashlim. It's the idea of taking a story and putting it alongside something else and using it as a teaching illustration. Now these are all over the Old Testament, which we're more familiar with than other Jewish sort of uh, sources and stuff. So there's a famous one from the Old Testament here about the life of King David. Many of you will know who David is. David was a great king for the most part. The Bible speaks really highly of him. It calls him a man after God's own heart, but there's this one episode in his life where everything goes disastrously badly. It says that at a time when the kings went out to war, the times where they went and got their aggression out, they exercised or whatever that was for that culture, uh, David stayed at home. 
and it said he sat on his rooftop. Of course, being the king, his rooftop was higher than everyone else's. And looking down, he saw a beautiful woman bathing and sent his guards to bring her to him. And of course, what follows is what always happens when men of power choose to abuse it in situations with women that have no power. I don't need to go into all the details. But if that was as bad as it got, it would be bad already, but it gets even worse. To cover up for his own sin, David chooses to bring the, man's, the woman's husband and try to trick him into getting involved in the situation and finally sends him out to battle to make sure that he's killed. David's life takes this disastrous turn based on a couple of awful decisions, and it says in the Bible that God is furious with this, guy, this character that was supposed to be a man after his own heart. And so he sends to him a prophet, now, prophets weren't sort of, they weren't respectable characters. They were often long hair, big beards, looking really dusty and, and whatever, and they lived on the, f- the fringes of society, and this prophet comes to see David, and this is what happens. The Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, there were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle. But the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb that he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Can you imagine David's reaction as, uh, Nathan's reaction as David is fuming with anger? He's like, I've got this sucker. This is gonna be wonderful. There's gonna be this moment where I'm gonna do the unveil and this guy's gonna be like, ah, it was me. That's Nathan's moment. As David starts to realize how angry he is about this, Nathan's response is, you are the man. How would David, do you think, have responded if Nathan had walked in with accusations about the actual series of events? The chances are he would have responded with arrogance, with pride, he would have tried to cover up. There's something about the story, the mashlim, that gets under the surface. It makes David respond emotionally to a situation that's like his, but not his. And then when the two are connected, he has no choice but to fall on his knees. And David goes through this process where he writes things like Psalm 51, these moments of repentance, of heartbreak about who he's become and what he has done. This is this ancient form, Mashlim, a story that has a point to it, usually for one person or a particular group. This kind of storytelling was a huge debate in Jewish society. Because it raised the question, how do people learn stuff? There were two kinds of schools of thought. There were one group of people, one group of rabbis that taught something called halakha, high thoughts about God, detailed information about who God was. And another group of people that taught something called haggadah, stories that connected with people at the most basic level. And in Jewish tradition, there's a town where two rabbis arrived, one teaching this high school of thought and one teaching these low stories. And the people of the town flock to this man with his low stories and ignore the guy with his high information. And the guy with the high information, the detailed thought, comes to his friend, his counterpart, and says, why is it that the people come to you? And in his own tradition, the man chooses to tell him a mashlim, a story. He says, two merchants arrive in a town, a poor community, One of them sets up his stall and presents a huge ruby and puts it there for sale. And another man comes and he puts out his stall with a collection of earthenware pots that are selling for a couple of pennies each. Who do the people go to? And the man looks and says, well, of course, they go to the man with earthenware pots because it's within their reach. The ruby's out of reach. The high thought is out of reach. The stories are what connects with our hearts. They're what teach us about God. And Jesus is tapping into this storytelling system in this brilliant way. But this Jesus' stories go far beyond anyone else's. His stories aren't just about individual points. They're stories that teach us how to live. The author Joan Didion tells us that we tell stories in order to live. 
Stories actually keep us going at times when moments are hard. I think Jesus would agree, but I think he'd also add this. He taught us stories in order that we might know how to live. These stories, these parables, they describe a way of life, a kingdom way of life that is beyond anything else accessible. And this is what we get to jump into for a few weeks. We are going to learn from a master storyteller who has perfected this craft. He takes stories about everyday life and he turns them into these spiritual lessons that are beyond belief. And we get to jump in with the first one, which we're calling just field. It's also known as the parable of the sower, and it's actually the most boring one to teach, and this is the reason. It's the only parable of Jesus where he gives you the interpretation afterwards. All of the others, he leaves you to kind of figure it out, he leaves you to do the work, and this one, he's going to tell us exactly what it means, and I'm kind of like, well, what am I here for? I can just read the passage and we're done, that's my job, Jesus, you're taking my job, I'm supposed to figure out what it means. Um, But of course, we'd much rather have him do it for us, and this is the parable. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake, such large crowds gathered round him, that he got into a boat and sat in it, while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places, where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly, because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came and the plants were scorched, they withered, because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop 160 or 30 times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let him hear. Jesus talks about a scene that people would have seen in everyday life. It's a farmer, and many of them would have owned their own farms or own lands. A farmer who goes out, he would carry a bag and he would walk in his property and he would scatter his seeds, wherever he went. The first, it says, falls on something like this. It falls on stones or rock, the surface of a hard, worn Jewish road that people have walked day after day after day. And it just sits on the surface. It doesn't go anywhere until the birds of the sky, hungry for sustenance, come and grab it before anything could possibly happen. He says, he continues, to walk, and the next lot falls upon an area where there is some soil, just enough for the seed to germinate, just enough for it to begin to grow. But so much stone is underneath that there's no real thing for the roots to catch hold of. It shoots up quickly because it's got that little bit of soil and it's looking for all the nourishment that it can get. But when the sun hits in the heat of the day, the little plants just wither and disappear. The next one falls where thorns grow. And of course, the young seeds try to grow, they land in good soil, but the, 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 the weeds, the, the thorns are stronger than they are. They choke the life out of this little seed. All the nourishment that is available, the seeds, are t- it's taken from them. They can't become what they're supposed to become. And then finally, the sum that falls on the good soil, the soil carefully prepared by this farmer for one purpose the soil that he's plowed with the sweat of his brow, that he's got ready, that he's prepared, and soil that will produce this crop. And it says 100 times, 60 times, or 30 times. And this idea of 100 times goes back way into Jewish history. There's this passage stuck back in Genesis where the idea of 100 times is this important thing. This is God's blessing on this land. This is what Jesus is hinting at. 100 times is what's supposed to happen. This is this parable that Jesus lands on his disciples. And they have a question, not about what the parable means, but Jesus, why are you talking in parables? Now we've touched on the fact that this was tradition, maybe they should have known that, but these were mostly uneducated men. But Jesus is gonna give them a really interesting reason as to why he talks in parables. The disciples came to him and asked, why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. Next slide. Next, there we go. 
In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. What's going on here? Is Jesus honestly telling us he put all this effort into telling these incredible stories just so people wouldn't listen? and wouldn't respond. On the surface, you might say yes, but I think there's something else going on under the surface here. And I think it's connected to this idea of raising children. Many of you, we've got many parents in the room, many of you are going through that phase where your kids are difficult, which is every phase from zero to ever. Uh, They'll always present different challenges, and you kids that are sitting in here, uh, you are always difficult, but you're always wonderful as well. That's why we love you. That's your little smiles and everything. They stop us throwing you out the window or something like that. They keep you in the family. We've threatened to sell you to a gypsy community so many times, but we never do. Why? Because he's He's got us in our hearts. We love the little guy, but he's difficult. (laughs) But think about what you do occasionally with parenting. Maybe you guys have been in this situation where you're having the same conversation for the millionth time. Maybe it's about the length of a skirt. Maybe it's the lateness of bedtime. Maybe it's how often you can use the car. It could be anything from any different realm of parenting. Think about all those conversations. And if you're not a parent, think about the times you've had that with your parents. And occasionally, my parents used to try this trick, and I've tried it with my kids, where eventually I go, do you know what? Do what you want to do. Do what you want to do. You're going to do what you want to do. Just go and do it. Learn the lesson, my friend. Go and find out that I was right all all along with my incredible wisdom that I've garnered over 30 odd years of life. This is my tactic for parenting. Do what you want to do. I'm going to let you find out for yourself. It's almost a challenge. Do I really want them to do what they want to do? Absolutely not. What I'm hoping is is that my tactic will inspire them to listen. It will inspire them to like new knowledge, to a sudden realization of, oh, I'm heading down the wrong path. This conversation that Jesus quotes is a conversation back in a book called Isaiah. And God has had this conversation with his people time after time after time. This is the way I've given you to live. When you don't follow it, things go badly. When you do, things go well. And finally, there's this moment where, Jesus, where God almost says to these people, do you know what? You're going to do what you want to do. It all turns on this Jewish phrase that kind of says, let them be. And it doesn't say, it's not like a curse that says, this is what you're going to be for the rest of your life. It's that phrase, it's that, that sense of, you're going to do what you want to do. If that's what you want, that's what you're going to get. But in actual fact, the whole point of it gets to this point here at the end where it says, and they would turn and I would heal them. That is the offer at the end. Just listen and I'll heal you. Just come back and there's restoration. That's this passage way back in Isaiah when Jesus tells stories. These stories are supposed to motivate you to something else. They're supposed to awaken you to the sense of, am I really listening? Am I really doing the work? We talked about the fact that these stories They're designed to teach some greater spiritual truth. If you want to get just a story, you can get just a story. But if you do the work, there's something far more on offer. When Jesus tells stories, I think it's based on the fact that he knows that simple information won't process in the same way that a story will. And as I thought about this, as I wrestled with how to describe this, this story came back to my mind. This is a picture of a guy called Micah True. He was a boxer in California back in the 90s, and he got sick of all the politics of boxing, and he decided he was going to move into the wilderness, spend his time living in small Mexican towns, but mainly out in a shack that he built himself, and he was just going to spend his time running. He happened to connect with a guy uh, that was writing for a magazine called Runner's World, called Christopher McDougal, and as the two of them talked, he talked about his experience just going out running these trails for hundreds of miles, and Christopher McDougal at the same time was going through this big question, why am I always injured? I run and I run, and every time I run, I get injured, and it seems like the more I spend on running shoes, the more injuries that I get. It seems like it shouldn't work that way, but my body just seems to be falling apart. Why is this happening? 
And as the two of them begin to dialogue, Micah True, who becomes known by the wonderful name of Caballo Blanco, the white horse, this mysterious ghost-like figure that lives in the middle of nowhere, starts to tell him how he runs often in cheap running shoes, sometimes in bare feet or just thong sandals, and he never gets injured. No plantar fasciitis for him, no blown out knees for him, he just runs and everything's fine. And the two of them continue to dialogue, and, and finally, Christopher McDougall decides, I'm going to take an adventure, I'm going to go and learn from this guy. Now, all the information that this guy has can be conveyed by email. There's no need for him to take a journey of thousands of miles to go and get this information. He can just tell him, yeah, this is what I do. This is what I've learned. Go and do it for yourself. But instead, he goes out and takes this adventure. And Caballo Blanco, this guy, tells him nothing about what he's learned. Nothing about the science of running. But he gives him an offer. Come running with me. So they set out for one of these extraordinary long runs. And Caballo Blanco turns to this man, Christopher McDougall, and he says, get behind me and do what I do. Get behind me and do what I do. So as he watches, he notices that, that Caballo Blanco no longer strikes with the heel like most runners do. Most of us, we run and we hit with our heel first and then we move onto our toes, but he lands on the soft balls of his feet. He notices how he keeps his body sort of loose and takes the blows from the ground. He notices how he keeps his arms close to him and, convert, and, and conserves energy. And over the weeks that they spend together, going out day after day after day for running, slowly his style of running morphs into the style of running that this guy has perfected over many years. And then he returns to America and goes running with friends. And there's this moment where they look at him and they say, you're like a different animal out here. Something has changed. The injuries disappear. He's become a runner in the style of this master runner that's hidden out in the wilderness somewhere. Caballo Blanco doesn't offer information on the science of running. He invites him into the hard work of day after day, run after run, doing the hard work out in the wilderness in the heat of the day. But that is where he learns. Jesus' parables offer us this tension. No easy answers for us. No just this is what you need to know. They're designed as catalysts. They're designed to ask you to do the work, to delve into these stories. If you take them as just stories, you'll get just stories. But if you're willing to do the work day after day, you find that you are following a master of spirituality and that they can be transformative for you. Jesus tells us parables as catalysts. They ask, are you willing to do the work? They ask the people that heard them at the time, are you willing to do the work? You can leave with a story, or you can jump in, you can delve in, and maybe you find something more. Which brings us back to Jesus' parable here, which we're going to kind of follow his description of. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth, they choke it, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. Jesus takes these four different elements and he turns them into four different personalities, four different responses to his message. And the first one is easy. When we look at it, the three here are separated. We'll deal with those later. There's three that are distinct and we'll come to those. But then there's this one, the first one he talks about, the one that is simply just a, a sense of I don't believe you, Jesus. You say all of these things, you teach all these things, but I don't buy it. Maybe that person never gets as far as investigating the stories, but there's one that's that sense of like, ah, that's the rejection. And then there's these others that are different types of people. There's the one that it says gets, gets sort of growing quickly, but then persecution comes. And think about the context these writers are writing in. They're writing about 30 to 50 years after Jesus has been alive, died, resurrected, gone back to heaven. 
There's this wrestling for them of this story of Jesus and the, the Roman government hate this thing called the church and the persecution is intense. And so there's ways that people are just starting off strong and then they're like, you know what, I can't do this. This is too hard, it's costing too much. And so they disappear. There's the people that are choked up by the cares of the world and this is the one I think more than anything, isn't this the one we're like, Matthew, my friend, I know of what you speak. There is so much stuff happening and it just seems to take up all my day. I know what that is all about. And then there's finally, there's the, there's the fourth one, which is the ideal that Jesus is pre- representing. This is the one that is encouraging us to be. This is the one that is saying, no, go after this. Be the one that produces fruit. I think, if we're honest, every single one of us, if we've made that decision, we've moved from that one to these three, there's some sense of, I, I see myself in all of those. Sometimes I feel like good things are happening, I'm, I'm involved in good things, and, and then there's other times where I'm like, man, I feel choked and careworn, and it feels like everything is getting to me. And then there's, there's this one, like, sort of stuck over here, where we're like, yeah, I, uh, I'm sometimes not very consistent, and sometimes I wonder if, you know, there's part of me that could end up just ditching this whole thing. I think there's, there's all of us in those things. Interestingly, Jesus never is accusative about any of them. Never judgmental. Never, you over here, you're a terrible person. What's wrong with you? Never any of these does he criticize. He simply points out, which are you? Which am I? The wonderful thing about parables is they always give us the option to choose. Always give us the option to choose. Next slide, guys. And the one after. You can leave that one. The implicit challenge is, which will you be? Which will I be? That's something we're going to see over in parables. Again, this is a wonderful quote from Bob Goff. We don't always get to pick the parable we're living, but we get to pick who we are in the parable. That's the message of the story. We get to pick which we are, but how? How do, we, how do we change? How do we, supposing we see ourselves in one of these, what do we do? What's the practical workout that says, I'm going to move from one to the other? And as we finish, I'm going to give you a few little ideas. Click onto the next slide, please, guys. The first, first one Jesus talks about is this sense of, is the path. It's the rejection of Jesus' story. And something you could do, my challenge to you is this, is examination. If you've chosen to reject the story of Jesus, have you really looked at it? If you have and you've come to that conclusion like, no, that's not right, I kind of get that. What I don't get is people not wanting this story to be true. To me, the Jesus story is this amazing thing, this idea of a God that loved the world, that shapes it. I would desperately want that story to be true. If you've come to the conclusion it isn't, I get it. But if you've come to the conclusion that you don't want it to be, I kind of don't get it. My question for you, if you feel like you're in this group, is have you looked at this story? Have you really given it your full attention? Have you just taken Jesus' parables as these little stories that kind of like they're nice, but they don't have anything, any sort of purpose to them? Go back and look at this story, wrestle with it. See what happens when you kind of do the hard work, when you follow this master of spirituality and the stories that he tells. The next one that Jesus talks about is this idea of it's stone, it's rootless. We might have the idea in this nation that we as sort of affluent followers of Jesus are somewhat persecuted. I think we say that because we don't know what real persecution looks like. There's countries all over the world where they experience real persecution for following Jesus. The stories that come out of places like Russia, out of China, out of North Korea, where just the persecution is intense. One of the ones that I love because it has an element of humor to it was about a group of followers of Jesus that were gathered together And two guys turned up, two guards with guns turn up and say, are there any followers of Jesus here? We're going to arrest you. And a couple of people say, no, no, I was here by accident and dash for the door. But a few of them stay and say, no, I follow Jesus. That is exactly what I'm doing here. And the guys put down their guns, take off the hats and say, good, now we know who the real believers are. Let's start some church service. There's that element of like, you know, they're testing, they're figuring it out. I think all of us, if we're honest, would say that if we were in that situation, would we survive that? If following Jesus became illegal tomorrow, how passionate are you about this thing that we do? I think we'd all like to say, yeah, I'd stick. 
But there's parts of us that would say, man, I just don't know. I've never experienced that before. One of the things with this here, one of the ideas that I had is this idea of conversation. As I worked in student ministry for years, one of the student ministries for years, one of the ideas we looked at was this. For students following Jesus, declaring that allegiance, telling people that they were following him was actually far more important in some ways than getting all their beliefs perfect. It was more important to stand up and say, do you know what, I am on board with this Jesus. He is my king, I am following him. That declaration was transformative in a way that giving them theological knowledge just doesn't work. There's this idea that, like, don't hire a first year grad student to be a youth pastor because they'll just be like, just read Calvin and everything will be fine. It's just nonsense. There's this sense of, like, actually declaring yourself for Jesus is this thing that's transformative. My sort of suggestion here is this conversation. Have you ever talked with anyone about your faith? Making that decision to say, I'm going to talk about the fact that I have this belief is so important. The truth is we live in a world that, well, we're not persecuted. There is this sense of sort of, sort of light-hearted amusement about people of faith. We have come to a belief somewhere that science can answer everything, and science is amazing. I love science. I've always loved science. It's fascinating in what we learn about the universe, but it can't do a turn to answer the why question that I find beating in my heart, and to me, the Jesus story still is the best story that I've found to explain everything that I see. Having that conversation with people about why this Jesus means something to you is something that I think develops those roots. It moves you from one category to another. Moving on, we've got stone, we've got... uh, Thorns, this overwhelmed sense of uh, life is just too busy. We live in a culture that worships two different things. It worships sex and success. So one of the worst sins you can commit as a good, honest American is not reaching your potential. Not reaching your potential, that's some kind of communist thing over there, we don't do that. We reach our potential in this country. The danger is, is it means that everyone has to be brilliant at something. As much as I love sports and I used to coach soccer for years, the travel culture for sports came from that sense of you have to be brilliant. And the heartbreaking thing is often you find out you are great but not quite great enough. And the thorns that build up in life just can become overwhelming. Should you stop doing it? Absolutely not. I'm not saying you should stop doing it. What I'm saying is this. Inventory is actually really important. Figuring out why am I involved and asking that wonderful Marie Kondé question for those of you that love the art of tidying up. Is it bringing me joy? Is it bringing my kids joy? Maybe the sacrifices you have to make for their joy, but it has to bring somebody joy. Otherwise, it needs to go. There's that sense of, why am I doing this? That inventory can start to awaken you to the thorns that build up and can be crushing to this Jesus journey that you're on. And finally, there's this push to move towards this one. This is what Jesus wants for us. It's that sense of soil, growth, and you get to invest. You get to ask this question. I get to ask this question. What what part do I get to play on this journey? How is God calling me to grow into the next thing that he has for me? The beauty of these Jesus stories, these Jesus parables, is we get to choose who we are. We don't get to choose the parable we're in, but we do get to choose who we are in the parable. We get to enter into this kingdom life. We get to learn from this master storyteller, this master of spirituality who isn't just offering information. He's offering a new way to live, a new way to do life. Which are you in the parable? Which am I in the parable? And which do you want to be? I'm going to invite the worship team to come up, and we're just going to take a moment to reflect. We're going to reflect on what would it take for you to live out the teaching of Jesus that we've learned this week. What would it take for you to move from one category to another category? If you find yourself feeling, I mean, this last one, what would it take for you to grow into that next thing that God has for you? And are you willing to do what he asks? Are you willing to take the parables as a catalytic story that asks you to make a response? Let's just take a moment to pray together. God, as we stop, as we process what we've learned, thank you for your stories. 
in an incredible way, you cast these stories along important truths and we learn in a way that we might never have learned otherwise. God, as, for us as a community, speak to us. To us as individuals, speak to us. Help us to follow you on the journey that you have for us. Help us to invite other people along that journey. God, for some of us, there's a challenge. There's a challenge to go and examine the stories that you told, to examine your life, to figure out what's the depth behind it. Is this just something we've never given serious consideration? Challenge us, God. For some of us, there's that rootlessness. Challenge us to bring faith into our conversation, to own following you in this world that doesn't always appreciate who you are. For some of us, there's thorns. There's so much stuff built up. There's no way we can just cancel it all, stop it all. There's no way we can go sit in the wilderness, spending our time running in sandals. But there are ways that maybe we need to take inventory to let some stuff go. It might require making brave choices. And finally, there's the, there's the good soil. God, that is what you made us for. You made us for good soil. To be 30, 60, 100 fold. God, help us to grow into what you have for us. Challenge us on the next thing. For some of us, maybe we've just taken it too easy, but you have ways for us to be involved, things for us to do. The wonderful joy of your kingdom story is that everybody has a place in this good kingdom. There's nobody that has nothing to do. Everybody has something to do. 